Um, so it looks like this weekend Mr. Falkas was not so successful with getting everybody here. But I mean, at least we are all still hopefully on the top of linear algebra. But it's not only the top of linear algebra, it's, um, it is the top of engineering mathematics, what we are doing currently. Yeah? Uh, so this is my strong belief. Um, and yeah, let's, let's repeat a little bit um, singular value decomposition. Um, yeah, so the point was that actually our goal was, let me see, do we have it here? Oh no, this was the, yeah. Um, we were in the process of doing function approximation. And um, so given our set of data points, sort is a parameter vector A. Yeah? And when we replace all our data points into the ansatz, which is a linear combination of basis functions, maybe we should write this on the blackboard. Huh? Um, so we are looking for a function f of x, which is a1 f1 of x plus a k f k of x. That's what we're looking for. And given our a set of data points, x i y i, i equal 1 to n. And now when we replace um, all our data points into the uh, function, then we get f of x i is equal to y i. Huh? And when we do this with this linear combination of basis functions on all our data points, what do we get then? Overfitting? Yes. Yes, that's right. But I mean, I mean, it need not be overfitting. It might even be underfitting. It may be exactly determined. But what is exactly determined? That's my question. I mean, we do get some equations. And how do they look like? We get a linear system of the type m times a vector is equal to y vector. Huh? That's what we get. And this y vector is the vector containing these yi. Yeah? And the, the data points xi, where do they occur here? Yes, in the matrix M. Yeah? Because the matrix M, Mij, is Fj of Xi. That's how this matrix M is defined. OK, so we get a linear system. But we are not at all finished. Because what you said, we may have overfitting here. Typically, we do have overfitting here. But we also may have underfitting. Depends. Huh? Uh, no, sorry, not overfitting. I'm sorry. We may have an, sorry, forget this, here. Huh? We don't have overfitting here. We may have an overdetermined linear system, or an underdetermined, or an exactly determined. We may have all these cases. Um, and then what we did in the last few weeks is we found some really nice methods for solving overdetermined systems, underdetermined systems, 
uh, which was the pseudo inverse method. Huh? But the pseudo inverse method may even fail. When may this method fail? If what is? If the determinant of m is zero, yes, yes. Um, Yeah, but this, um, I mean, this may happen even in the exactly determined case where m is a square matrix. Huh? But in the overdetermined case, then m isn't even a square matrix. So then m is any rectangular matrix, and then for this case, we apply the pseudo inverse method. Huh? Okay, but this may even fail. When does this fail? So what is the condition for the pseudo-inverse method to be successful? Invertible matrix not be invertible. Oh no. We are, which matrix? I mean it depends on which matrix must be invertible. M? No. I mean that's exactly we apply the pseudo-inverse method for these cases where M is a rectangular, not square, non-square matrix. And then you can't talk about invertible. Huh? Okay, so it might become even worse. It might become even worse. Under which circumstances is the pseudo inverse method um, successfully applicable? What is the condition on M? M must have full rank. If M has full rank, then M transpose M is invertible. Huh? So then, I mean, M transpose M is a, a symmetric square matrix. And this symmetric square matrix is invertible if M has full rank. Huh? But if M has not full rank, then we are in trouble even with the pseudo-inverse method. And for this extreme case, people invented the singular value decomposition, which you can apply always. Huh? Okay, that's what we did last time. Um, yes. So we are, in, we are now in the case where M has not full rank. And then this symmetric square matrix is not invertible. Okay, and now what we then do is we write down the eigenvalue equation for M transpose M. Huh? We determine these eigenvalues sigma i square. Um, yeah, and I mean we don't go into the details here. Um, so we solve the eigenvalue problem for M. And we get these eigenvalues and then we come to these equations. Huh? M times V1 is equal to sigma 1 times U1. And uh, yeah, my, uh, maybe sh yeah, we should look back. Yeah. So, no. The V's, the V's are the eigenvalues of our matrix M transpose M. Huh? And the U's, ah, sorry, the V's are the eigenvectors of M transpose M and the U's are the eigenvectors of M M transpose. Huh? And with these eigenvectors and the eigenvalues, and the, I mean that's quite nice. The eigenvalues of M transpose M are the same as the eigenvalues of M M transpose, which is quite surprising on the first side. Why is this surprising? Could somebody close this window, please? Why is this surprising? Why is it surprising that M transpose M and M M transpose have the same eigenvalues? So we talk about this matrix and about with this matrix. And these two matrices are, they may be extremely different. 
And that's why it's surprising. Why are these, in, in many cases, these two matrix, matrices are very much different? Let's talk about M. We are talking about the case where M is not a square matrix. And in many, ex many applications, M is, so, so this, this linear system is extremely overdetermined. We may have, let's say, seven basis functions, but 10,000 data points. What is the shape of M then? So our M then looks like that. Huh? It's extremely narrow but very high. Huh? Okay, and then, I mean, M transpose looks like that. And what we get here is M transpose M. But what is M M transpose? MM transpose is this. It's, so this is MM transpose. And this is M transpose M. So this is a tiny square matrix, 7 by 7. And this is a large square matrix, 10,000 by 10,000. And now what we have seen is that these two matrices have the same eigenvalues. So, um, yeah, if we diagonalize these two matrices, and that's actually what eigenvalue decomposition does, yeah? the diagonalized version of this and that matrix, they are by, by no means the same because this, is, this becomes a 10,000 by 10,000 diagonal matrix and this is 7 by 7 diagonal matrix. But, uh, I mean, what the case is that this tiny diagonal matrix is just the upper left block of this large diagonal matrix and all the rest of the diagonal is zeros. So we, here we have only zeros, and we may have some zeros in here too. Yeah. yeah. That's what we have seen. Okay, and now we are able to. Uh, I mean, here we have the eigenvalues of of m transpose m, the uh, eigenvectors, and these are the eigenvectors of m m transpose, and these are the common eigenvalues, and we only take these eigenvalues which are non-zero, because for the others, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, for the others we have zero and zero on the left and right hand side. And that's what we get uh, when we write this whole thing as a matrix equation. Um, yes, and then we add some more orthogonal vectors here and here, and then we get this system, and uh, finally we can write it in this form. M times this V matrix is U times the sigma, sigma matrix. If we solve for M, um, we get this equation. Yeah? And that's the singular value decomposition with these two matrices U and V containing the eigenvectors and the matrix sigma which is a diagonal matrix with the eigenvalues yeah, which is actually this matrix. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so what should we repeat? Where did we stop last time? Maybe here on this slide?
Oh no, we continue. Did we did we look at the I, I sorry, I don't remember. Did we look at the regularized version of SVD? No, we didn't. We didn't because I prepared it yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. But did we did we finish this? Yeah, maybe we should uh, we should really uh, start here. Huh? Um, I mean, this is really um, an important result. No matter how this matrix M looks like, we can always factorize it in such a form. Huh? Um, oh yes, and, and this also is, is uh, quite nice to look at this equation. So we can write this product of the th uh, three matrices in such a form. So here we have the first eigenvector of M, M transpose times the first eigenvalue times the first eigenvector of M transpose M. Yeah? Um, yeah, and look at, look at this. This is quite nice. Yeah, look at this product of U1 times V1 transpose. And try to imagine how this product looks like. The one is a row vector and the other is a column vector. So we have sigma 1 times, I mean sigma 1 is a scalar so we can just pull it in front, huh? times u1 times v1 transpose, which is sigma 1 times u11 to u1, is it n or m? What is the length of u? Um, let's see. M. U is M. Yeah. Now where are we? Here? Yeah. Times this row vector V11 to V1N. So what we get here is a matrix. Huh? So the product of these two, here the column vector and here the row vector, gives us a matrix. Huh? So look here. This, this thing here already is a matrix. And all these terms are matrices of the same size. So the whole thing is a sum of matrices. Huh? And that's finally what we can write in this way. Yeah. You may also look at it in the following way. For the moment, forget this matrix sigma in the middle. Huh? If it's U times V transpose, then it's a product of two matrices which when you calculate it on the component level, there is a sum, a sum over this middle value, uh, index. Huh? And that's the sum we see here. Okay, yeah. And we can also write, yeah, now um, the pseudo inverse of this matrix M. That's actually what we want. Yeah? Our goal is to get a new pseudo inverse. Yeah? So we want to, our goal is to invert this matrix M. Yeah? Yes, and I mean, look, maybe we should go to the blackboard again here. 
let's just try to write m inverse which is u sigma v transpose. Please don't write this down because this is not formally correct. Of course, I mean m is a, a not a square metric so it doesn't make sense to write m inverse. Huh? Um, yeah, maybe we shouldn't do it. Maybe we should write m plus. Huh? So a pseudo inverse. That's what we can write all the time. Huh? Um, and then we get the plus here. Huh? And now for, for a pseudo inverse we have some rules. For example one rule is which is um, the same as for a real inverse. If we invert the product of matrices this is um, so the inverse of a product is the product of the inverses but in the reverse order. Huh? So we get then V transpose plus times U plus, uh, sorry, times uh, sigma plus times U plus. Huh? Yeah. Okay, and I mean in case if there is an inverse of a matrix, then the inverse and the pseudo inverse are the same. And these matrices U and V, they are invertible because they are orthogonal matrices. And in case of an orthogonal matrix, the inverse is equal to the transpose. So this is V times sigma plus times um, U transpose. And that's what you see over there. Yeah. And the only thing is to find out what is sigma plus. What is the pseudo inverse of sigma? And here you see it. I mean sigma was the matrix with sigma 1 through sigma r in the diagonal and now our sigma plus is um, such a diagonal matrix with the reciprocals in the diagonal of the sigmas. Huh? I mean this is intuitive. I don't prove it. It's up to you in one of the ex next exercises to prove this. Huh? Uh, to prove that the pseudo inverse of our sigma is exactly this. Okay, so we get to this equation. So now we have the formula to compute a new pseudo inverse even if m has not full rank. So we first calculate, oh, oh yeah, it's on the next slide. Let's go to the next slide. So what we do is we first look for the eigenvectors of M M transpose. Then for the eigenvectors of um, yeah, th then we look for the eigenvalues, um, and then for the eigenvectors of uh, M transpose M, which gives us the matrix V, and then we have all we need: U, sigma, and V. Um, and then we substitute these guys into this equation to get M plus. Okay, and, and what to do now? I mean, actually that's missing on this slide, is it? Yes. Now we have M plus. But we are not interested in M plus. What do we want to have? Hmm? We, want to have a. we want to have A. Yes, oh, where is our equation? So we wanted to solve M times A is equal to Y. And now we can solve it because, I mean, what do we, uh, we multiply this equation from the left with M 
plus and then we get a is equal to m plus times y. And we are finished now. This gives us our vector a. We are making uh, a slight error because m plus is not exactly m. Oh yes, sorry. Uh, I mean, yeah. So it's, uh, how should we write it? A vector hat. So it's only an approximation of, um, yeah, actually, can we talk about making an error? Because there is no exact A. There is no exact A. There is no solution. There is no solution for this equation. Yeah? Remember. So what we do, because there is no solution, we said, okay, let's minimize the norm M times A minus Y, the two norm. We minimize this difference. Yeah? And the vector A that minimizes this difference is what we get here. Huh? Okay, yeah. So we are right here at this point. That's what we can do. Um, But now we can, uh, we have to ask the question, how can we add a regularization term to this? You remember, um, we did least square solution, pseudo inverse method, and then, and now we can talk about overfitting. Now, in some cases, we may get overfitting. This is typically the case if uh, the number of basis functions is in the same order of magnitude as the number of data points. Huh? And then we may get overfitting. And, we, and one way to solve the overfitting problem is to add a regularization term. Huh? So in our minimization, we add, for example, the two norm um, of our vector a. Yeah? And then we minimize this sum. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, we have such a, a constant lambda. Yeah? Um, because, I mean, if we put lambda equal to zero, then we have no regularization. We get the exact, maybe overfitting solution, and the larger lambda becomes, the smaller our coefficients become. So for lambda towards infinity, of course, this term dominates and we get A equals zero. zero huh? So you can get everything between overfitting and zero. Huh? Okay, um, and this, this led to the solution. Um, let's write this solution down. A vector is equal to um, lambda times the identity plus m transpose m inverse times m transpose times y vector. That was our solution, including the regularization term. Okay, but now, now we do SVD and we have this formula for calculating our approximation for A. The formula is no longer like this. M transpose M inverted times M, tra M transpose. That's the pseudo inverse solution. And we just have to add lambda I here. Um, but now it's different. Now we we do it like that. And the pseudo-inverse doesn't have this form anymore. The pseudo-inverse now has this form. And now the question is, how should we now add the regularization term? And I, I mean, I just give you the solution without a proof. Um, this is a solution how we can add a regularization term 
which is kind of similar to what we did here. Uh, so we take m plus times m, add the regularization term. Look, this is a square matrix and lambda times the identity is being added here, then the inverse of this times m plus times y. So there also is a regularized uh, version um, of SVD. And one of the next exercises um, of course is to apply, uh, to program SVD which in Octave or MATLAB is not diff uh, difficult because there is a command called SVD. Yeah? So you apply SVD to your matrix M and then you get sigma, V and U and I mean you just have to plug it all together and that's it. Yeah? So that's quite easy. So that's one of the next exercises and another exercise is to do it of course with regularization term which is uh, quite easy too. So if you solve the last exercise which was the polynomial and RBF approximation in your programs you just have to replace the pseudo inverse by uh, the SVD solution. So you don't have to, in your program, you don't have to dive into the details of eigenvectors, eigenvalues and all this. You just apply it. Yeah? Uh, but of course you should understand it and that's why we now look at an example. Yeah? Um, yeah. So the task is to find uh, or to do SVD on this rectangle or matrix M, uh, which is actually an underdetermined case. Oh yes, we, I should mention this here. SVD has the nice property that it can be applied always. No matter whether our system is underdetermined, overdetermined or exactly determined. You can apply it always. Uh. Before we had to, uh, to switch depending on whether it's under or over determined. SVD can, can be applied uh, always. Okay, so this is our matrix M and now we, we calculate M, M transpose which gives us this uh, symmetric square matrix um, and now we, uh, we determine the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And for this, we have to, um, to calculate the determinant of the matrix minus lambda times the identity. Um, so that's the matrix we get. We, just, we, we get, just get minus lambda on the diagonal. That's what we have to add. And then the determinant is the product of these two guys minus the product of these. Um, and that's what we get. Huh? So this is the so-called characteristic uh, polynomial and um, yeah, and this can be factorized in that way. Um, so you see, here you already see the two, uh, the, the two eigenvalues, those are the two lambda values that solve determinant equals zero, which is lambda equal 25 and lambda equal 9. Yeah. Okay, so the two eigenvalues sigma 1 squared is 25 and sigma 2 squared is 9 uh, and the sigmas of course are the square roots which are 5 and 3. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, so now we have the eigenvalues of M, M transpose. Um, yes, and do we, no, we don't have the eigenvectors yet. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. I mean, to get the eigenvectors, now we take the lambdas, replace them in the matrix, and solve this system for the eigenvectors. Yeah. Um, and we get as the, as the two solutions of this two by two system, we get this u1 equal. I mean, it's it's actually you see this is one one and then normalized. It's easy to see that the vector 1, 1 is a solution of this system. If you multiply this by 1, 1, then you see you get a 0 here and you get a 0 in the second uh, row. Um, so 1, 1 is an eigenvector, but we want to normalize them because our matrix U has to be an orthogonal matrix. So this is the first solution normalized. And um, here we have the second eigenvector, which is 1 minus 1. Um, let me see, why is this an eigenvector? Yeah, klar. Ach, oh yeah, yeah. This is this is uh, for the for for the first eigen uh, value 25. Yeah. Then if we substitute the second eigen value, then you will see. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So this is uh, u1 and u2. Okay. We have to do the same thing with M transpose M in order to get the matrix V. Yeah? So uh, if we take M transpose M and subtract 25 times the identity, then that's what we get. Um, and I mean this can be um, reduced, so applying the uh, elimination on the matrix, then that's what we get. And uh, one eigenvector, yeah, now you can see um, if we multiply this vector onto this matrix, we get a zero. Of course, I mean, with one, one here in the first two uh, rows of our column vector um, and a zero in the last row, we get the zero. Yeah? So this is an eigenvector of this matrix. And the same thing with the, uh, the second eigenvalue gives us this matrix and we get this eigenvector. Yeah, I think we don't have to go through all the details here. Okay, yeah. Now for, for the third uh, eigenvalue, which was zero, um, yeah, for these zero eigenvectors, uh, eigenvalues, what we did is, should we go back? Yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, that's what we did. So we, we started with the non-zero eigenvalues and added all the eigenvectors to this V matrix and to the U matrix. And then we expanded this matrix with some eigenvectors, uh, sorry, not eigenvectors, with some vectors which are orthogonal to all these and orthogonal among them. Yeah? So here in our example, we have to, to add one extra vector which is orthogonal to the eigenvectors that we already have. Um, where are we? Yeah. So for lambda 3 equals 0, find the unit vector orthogonal to v1 and v2. Huh? Um, or, I mean, what we also could do is we could solve uh, this eigenvector equation 
for the eigenvalue lambda 3 equals 0, which, yeah. And the solution is this vector. Uh -huh. Okay, and yeah, now we are finished. Um, so this is the U matrix. This is our sigma matrix containing uh, sigma 1 and sigma 2, which, which are the square roots of the eigenvalues. And uh, here we have um, U transpose. Um, yeah, let me see. No, sorry, this is V transpose. This is U and this is V transpose. Yeah. And you see in the third row we get V3 transpose. And in the first two rows we get V1 and V2 transpose. Let's see. Is this correct? Yes, this is V2. And uh, yeah, that was V1. I mean, here you see again that these matrices, U and V, they are square matrices, but of different sizes. Yeah? And, and that's why here in between we need a rectangular matrix in order to, to get out of, uh, I mean, this matrix having three rows and three columns must be transformed into a matrix with um, two rows. Huh? And that's what we get with a two by three matrix. Okay, yeah, now we have M and of course we want to have M plus, which is, I mean, this matrix transposed here and this matrix transposed here and uh, the pseudo-inverse of this matrix, which is quite easy. We just transpose it and take uh, the reciprocals of these diagonal elements. So, yeah, now we are finished. Okay, yeah. Um, and in the exercises we have two um, similar examples for you. Um, the first example is, yeah, it's one, uh, let me see, quite similar to this example. Um, yeah. Look, this matrix M is actually a matrix with full rank. So you, we, could, we could have done the ordinary pseudo-inverse method here. Huh? And in, in the exercises there is one exercise where it's similar to this case where the matrix M has full rank and there you should compare the result and show that the result with the ordinary pseudo-inverse method is the same. And in a second example, it has not, no full rank and there, I mean, you can't compare because pseudo-inverse can't be applied. Okay, yeah, and now, I mean, we're really on top of our function approximation chapter now. Um, but uh, we are not on Mount Everest yet. Huh? There is this Mount Everest which is quite hard and uh, now let's, let's uh, from this summit look over to Mount Everest, uh, how, it, how high it is and how it looks like. Uh? I mean there are higher and steeper mountains to climb and now let's have a, a peek on these higher mountains. Yeah, and let's remember what we did. What we did all the time, please remember this, was linear regression. Linear regression. So we, we always had the, the assumption that our function we are looking for 
is a linear combination of k basis functions. I mean, we, you can use arbitrary basis functions fk. It doesn't matter. You can use whatever you want. They may be as non-linear as you like. But, I, I mean, and that's important to remember. Linear regression is not about using linear basis functions. Yeah? I mean, linear basis functions would be the case that we just have here a1 times x1 and so on plus ak times xk, something like that. Yeah? Um, but here we allow, we allow arbitrary nonlinear basis functions. Okay, and now let's remember what we did. First we put the constraint that f of xi should be equal to yi. Let's say that's what we would like to have. Huh? And in some cases it's even possible to solve this equation, but not in the under and over determined case. Okay, so we have these constraints and now we replace our uh, constraints into our Ansatz equations. And that's what we get, this linear system. Huh? We get this linear system, which is overdetermined. And because it's overdetermined, we have no solution. And now the next step is we say, OK, we can't solve this, so minimize the difference. We minimize the error. This is the error, the, the root mean square error on the data. We, min we minimize this error. Okay, and what did we do in order to minimize the error? We calculate the gradient with respect to our parameter vector a of the error and set this gradient equal to zero. And as a solution, we get the pseudo-inverse. And now look at this solution. This solution is just multiplying the pseudo-inverse um, of m, which is this, this term, by y. Huh? And it's, I mean, we are very lucky that this is a linear formula. Yeah. Actually, I mean, the, what we get when we set the gradient of the error equal to zero is the following equation. Um, we get the equation, um, no, m transpose m times is equal to m transpose y. That's what we get. Yeah? We get this linear system and we have to solve this linear system. And that's very fortunate that we get a linear system. And the reason basically is, there are two reasons why we get a linear system. Reason number one is, we use a linear combination of our basis function. And we were quite smart in minimizing um, the sum of squared errors. Yeah? We, could, we could minimize something different. We could minimize, for example, um, excuse me. Yeah. So we, we yeah we could minimize the three norm. 
the three norm or the one norm, it all wouldn't be nice. Yeah? Actually, the worst thing would be this, because this is the absolute value and this function is not differentiable. This function is actually differentiable if you take the three norm or the four norm or the five or the six or the seven norm. They're all differentiable, but you get problems. What happens if you take the three norm? Huh? If you put it on the gradient, you no longer get a linear system. Yeah. Right? We get a linear system because with the two norm we have a square and take the, the gradient takes the square off so we don't have an exponent anymore and uh, the whole system is linear. Huh? Okay. But taking the, the two norm wouldn't help if this here becomes nonlinear. If this is nonlinear, then even the inner derivatives are nonlinear, and then here at this point you, you don't have a linear system anymore. You get a system of k nonlinear equations for k variables. And this is I mean, this is the exit from the freeway. I mean, up to here we are on the freeway. Everything is going easy. Linear algebra, you can just apply uh, standard linear algebra. But as soon as you have nonlinear equations, it's even not really easy to solve one nonlinear equation with one variable. Huh? What we did last semester, we did the fixed point uh, solution, Newton method, and so on. Solving one nonlinear equation with one variable is not trivial at all. But if you get a system of 15 nonlinear equations with 15 variables, you can forget it. Huh? At least symbolically. There is no, uh, normally, there is no, no chance to find a symbolic solution. And then what you do is, you can go into numerics. Huh? You can numerically try to solve this system with many equations for many unknowns. And there are numeric methods. There is a Newton method which is multidimensional. But even numerical solution of such nonlinear systems is a very, very critical issue. In very many cases there is no chance to get even an approximation of the solution. So the nonlinear world is really ugly. Huh? I mean, that's a point in mathematics. If you are on the freeway, everything is nice. You use the standard methods. I mean, you may even get numerical problems here. You have seen it maybe in the exercises last week. There was this example with the polynomials. And if you took the, the degree 10 polynomial, then at least I and all the students I have seen got numerical problems. So Octave then said um, matrix is singular to machine precision, and that's it. Yeah? And you won't get a solution anymore. So even in the linear cases, you may get numerical problems. But this is no comparison to what happens in the nonlinear case. So the, you, you have no, no chance anymore. And that's very unfortunate. Because sometimes you really want to have a nonlinear combination of basis functions. Look, let's look at such, such an example. Um, suppose we know, suppose we know there is some underlying process, um, for example, uh, there would be something like that, which would be a sine function with an added exponential term, 
but we don't know the frequency here and we don't know how fast this exponential goes to zero and then the ansatz would be a times e to the power bx plus uh, c times the sine of dx and here we go these two parameters b and d they appear nonlinear and there is no chance to, to linearize this function uh, if you would have only this guy you could linearize it so if you wouldn't add the sign here you could linearize it we did it actually last semester how, how can you linearize this No, no, fixed point iteration is a way to numerically solve this in one dimension. Huh? Huh? Yeah. If you apply the log on both sides, then the b comes down and uh, the whole thing uh, is linear. But apply the log to this sum doesn't help you. Huh? So here you have no more chance. Even though we only have two basis functions, but this thing is nonlinear, and all we did in the last weeks doesn't help us anymore. One idea. Couldn't you that problem finding another minimization function so that the derivative of the minimization function will work counter this uh, ansatz? What do you mean with, uh, with another minimization function? Um, we, for example, if, if we wouldn't have uh, squared, uh, if we don't have linear ansatz, but for example squared ansatz, then we have the inner derivative of uh, the gradient of the minimization function. And if we don't use, for example, the, the two norm, but some other norm, so it works together, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, you, you, you check. But finding that norm could be... So your job is finding, <laughs> finding the, the correct norm. So you give me the right norm and I do the rest, okay? I mean, I guess you need to be very creative to find a norm, even for this simple problem here. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So I don't go into the detail of this problem, but I give you a hint. Look, there in the far distance there is Mount Everest, and you would climb up like that. Huh? And that's what we see on the next slide. Huh? Um, so the, the, our goal is still the same. The error e on the data must become a minimum. So the gradient of the error with respect to our parameter vector a still should become zero. And how do we find... Our goal is to find such a parameter vector a that makes the error equal to zero. And now for the moment we forget all the symbolic mathematics. Huh? We just look at the, prob uh, the, at the problem. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean the problem actually is that this gradient of the error function equals zero, that this system of equations is nonlinear. That's the problem. Huh? Um, and now what, 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 uh, what people do, and this is what people do in, in AI for solving such uh, problems, um, we do gradient descent. Huh? Um, and what is gradient descent? Gradient descent is adjusting our parameter vector a in the direction of steepest descent. And I want to show you this on this little picture here. Um, so now suppose the picture is the following. This is the direction of a1 and this is the direction of a2. So suppose we are in two dimensions and we are looking for two such parameters. Yeah? 
So this may be the case, maybe we just have this. We are looking for C and D of such a sine function. Huh? Um, and these are the two parameters. And now we, we do have our error function. And this error function depends on the parameters. It depends on, on, on many things. It depends on your basis function, it depends on the data, and it depends on the parameters. But what's fixed is the set of basis function and the data. That's fixed. So we can vary now these two parameters, a1 and a2. And as a matter of fact, this function e is a function of the coefficients. Yeah? So here we have a, a sum contour plot. Suppose this would be the error function. Yeah? And suppose here we have some maxima and there we have a minimum. Uh, and now the goal is to start with an initial vector a. And suppose now we start here on, on, on such a peak, uh, which is of, of course by far a non-optimal a. Oh no, let's, no, let's suppose. Suppose these are minima. Uh, we have these four minima and here we have a maximum. Sorry. That's much better. Let, let, let's, say, let's say it's much more realistic. Oh, how does this? It should erase. Ah, yeah, okay. Now suppose we start, um, let's say here, at this point. That's our initial vector A. And what we do now is we do gradient descent. And what is the gradient in this picture? Who can tell me? What is the gradient, uh, I mean, what is your intuition about the gradient in such a picture? Mm, no, no, not at all. We did some uh, repetition of analysis last, last semester. What is the gradient of such a multidimensional function? I mean, you might say it's the vector containing all the partial derivatives, yes. But this vector, in which direction does it point? The gradient tells you the direction of steepest ascent. So if you, you're going to climb Mount Everest, then the gradient tells you the shortest way to the summit. Yeah? It may be the steepest wall of uh, Mount Everest, but it's the shortest way. Yeah? Okay, so if we look, we're almost on the summit of this uh, mountain here. So the gradient points in this direction. Don't worry about the length of this vector, but it, this is the direction, okay? Um, so this gradient vector, it's like a compass showing you, okay, this is the direction to the summit. But actually we don't want to, uh, to find the summit. We, far, we want to go back down into the valley. Yeah? So we just go into the direction of the negative gradient. We go into this direction. And yeah, let's, let's assume we make quite a big step. Like we start from here and we go to here. Yeah? Um, and in the next step, we, uh, we again look at the direction of our negative gradient, which maybe is like that here. So this is our next step, and now we are here. And um, das stimmt nicht. Senkrecht zu den Höhenlinien. Ja. Okay. Ja. 
Der geht senkrecht runter. Oh, sorry. Na, wieso tut das ja nicht löschen? Jetzt. Okay. Okay, view here and and the, yeah, the, the the negative gradient goes in this direction. Yeah. And now we are probably here. And then the, gra the negative gradient points in this direction. And yeah, maybe now we are here. And now the gradient points, negative gradient in this direction. And now you see the, uh, already you see kind of the problem we have. The whole thing depends on step size. So if we really make big steps, I don't know, maybe this is a big step, and it's a big step, and now we are here, and we take this step, and we would actually want to, to end up here, but we make this big step, and now we are here. Okay, uh, but, I mean, it's not really a big problem, because when we are here, our negative gradient, of course, again points down to this point. But now we are back on the other side of the, of the, the lowest point, and we would start oscillating back and forth. Huh? How can we solve this problem? Decreasing the step size. Yeah, decreasing the step size. Make smaller steps. Okay. I mean, now let's, let's erase the whole picture. Yeah. So if we make really tiny steps, then we start from here with really tiny steps. And it would take us, of course, much longer time to get down to the valley. And this is, this is a heuristic approach. I mean, you really have to fix your step size such that you find the minimum. And, and that, that's really problematic because it's not easy to find such intuitively uh, a good step size because the whole thing depends on your landscape. If this landscape is very smooth, then you can work with large step size. But suppose there is a very narrow canyon and you want to get down there, then you need extremely small step size because otherwise you would just jump back and forth over the canyon. Yeah? Uh, so it, it all depends on the structure of your function, but in uh, 55 dimensions it's not easy to get an intuition about this function. In particular, look, we are looking, we are talking about this error function. And this error function depends on your basis functions, on your data points, and on the parameters. And I mean these data points, this is just a file with 10 megabyte of numbers. Can you tell from these numbers how this error function look li looks like? I mean you could start trying to plot it, but how would you do this in 55 dimensions? So could, you could look at a projection of two dimensions, but what does that help you? Are these the two critical dimensions? That's impossible. So this is really not easy. This is not easy and not trivial and people do research uh, since there is numerical mathematics and AI and didn't perfectly solve the problems. I mean there are nice algorithms but we don't have the time to go into the details of these algorithms. Huh? I just want to show you that there are ways to solve, to numerically, approximately solve this high dimensional optimization problem. Yeah, uh, there are ways to get approximate solutions sometimes. Huh? But this problem is not computable. Finding a, a global minimum in n dimensional space of arbitrary functions Let's suppose these functions are even infinitely often continuously differentiable. This doesn't help you either. No? Even in this case the problem is not computable. This has been proven 
by famous researchers like, for example, Eigen. Yeah? Um, yeah. So it's, it is not computable. So in the general case, there is no algorithm that will give you the optimal solution. And there is quite a simple reason for this. We have seen it. Look, here we have four minima. And now suppose this one would be the global minimum. Because it's a few meters lower than this guy. How would you find this when you start here with gradient descent? No chance. No chance. You would find it if you would start here. But who tells you where to start? Nobody. So it's, it's, it is a hard problem. There are algorithms which are guaranteed to find a local minimum. Yeah? There are such algorithms. So if in the limit you make your step size extremely small, then it's guaranteed that you find a local minimum with step size towards zero. Yeah? So in infinitely long time you will find a local minimum. Yeah? That's what, what's guaranteed. Yeah? But in finite time a global minimum, no chance. Yeah? yeah, that's really unfortunate. I don't know why why God made mathematics uh, so hard and difficult for us. But if you have infinite time, you can start with infinite starting points, running that algorithm, then you'll find uh, yeah, the yeah. minimum as well. If you yeah. have infinite time, that's no problem. But you need um, infinite times infinite time. Huh? Exactly. <laughs> but I give you an even better solution. You only need infinite to the power one time if you have infinite computational resources. You need a parallel computer with infinitely many machines, then you only need infinite time. Huh? So you can, you can choose whether you need uh, infinite square time or just infinite. Huh? Okay, yeah. And that's it. Yeah, so we are finished for the moment. And um, I don't have any other prepared lecture today, but um, let's talk about what we do on Wednesday. There was one student, uh, the Chinese, yeah, you, uh, you sent me an email asking for a uh, questioning hour, which is actually a good idea. And basically, all our exercise sessions are nothing but an individual question hour. Huh? And that's very important for you to remember that this is your chance to ask individual questions. Huh? And I definitely want this coming Wednesday to have such a question hour. Huh? Um, and I ask you to prepare your questions for Wednesday. And we are only three tutors, maybe four? No? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you're on the, on the opposite side. <laughs> okay, fine. So we are only three tutors. And I mean, if I would be in your position, I would have questions only for me for two hours. Huh? So we are too few tutors, that's the point. And uh, I mean, we can do such an individual questioning session, but sometimes, and I have seen it last time, then one of the assistants sits with this group and the other assistant with this group and I with the third group for 90 minutes and all the rest don't get their questions answered. We will do this, but maybe we can do a compromise between an individual questioning hour and um, answering some questions for everybody on the blackboard because there is quite a number of questions that everybody has. And now let's try to collect your questions for Wednesday. And I would li like to ask you, Elias, 
to look at these questions and sort them and maybe some of the questions are from everybody and then we could uh, answer them on the blackboard and answer some individual questions too. Would that be okay for you? Yeah? Okay, so now let me ask you, who has got any questions? You. Only you. Let me tell you that you are a brave guy. Huh? You are a brave guy because you ask all these questions they don't dare to ask. Huh? But I ask you, everybody, I want to have at least one question from everybody. Huh? Um, I will only admit entrance to people on Wednesday who will send a, at least one question before Wednesday to us. Nobody enters this room without posting a question before Wednesday. And you can of course give us uh, 59 questions if you want, no problem. We will, I would suggest we use our Inkidu questioning tool because then you're even allowed to anonymously ask the thumbest question you can imagine. Yeah? It's anonymous, nobody knows from, from whom this thumb question comes. Is that okay? So everybody, I will send in, in a half an hour this URL to the mailing list and then you enter this form and there you enter your text questions. Huh? Um, yes, you can enter as many questions as you want. Huh? But maybe you, you just start a new line with every new question so it makes us, it easier for us huh? to sort them out. Okay, and on, on Wednesday we will have this uh, questioning hour. Okay, thank you.